you could all please either uh, use your audio controls or use star six to mute your phone. We'll be able to hear the speakers without any background interruption. We will take questions at two points during this, uh, this webinar, and we're going to use the chat function to do that because it's easier uh, to know who's got a question and not have people interrupt each other. So on the left-hand side of your screen, you should see a box that at the top says chat, and then under it, it has a, a thing that says chat, questions and answers. Below that, it tells you that there's a space to type your message. And under that, you can select your, your chat recipient. So you can direct a message to the entire audience, uh, to all the co-presenters, or to any one of the particular presenters, or indeed it looks like you can do it to other people in the audience as well. Um, we're going to ask you to put your questions in that chat box. And that way, they're there. And then when we're ready to take questions, I will go back, ask them of whoever the appropriate person is, and we'll make sure they get answered. Um, but that uh, many webinars have shown that that practice is a lot easier than trying to have people ask it on the phone and uh, interrupt each other or step over each other, and it also avoids the background problem. So um, having said that, um, after the webinar is over, we will um, circulate the uh, slides, and we will also make the recording available. Um, but for the moment, what I'd like to do right now is get started. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this movement, and while I do it, I would like you guys all to fill in a poll so that we have a little bit of a sense of the audience. Um, and I think the poll should be activated by my clicking on it. Let's hope it is. Um, so here is what, yeah. if you just joined us, please mute your phone using star six. So about 10 years ago, Hetty Chang started to look at the impact of chronic absence on children's performance in school. What she found was that even for really young children, missing school frequently had an alarming effect on their academic success, and over time became a strong predictor of which children would fail to graduate. She began to develop a national campaign about the need to track attendance by child, not by school or classroom, so that schools could see who was missing school regularly. She also identified ways that schools could improve attendance. At the same time, Brad Strong at Children Now in California was looking for an early indicator of which children would fail to graduate. The experience of San Diego in his state showed him that absence was a critical indicator. Brad and Hetty started to work together to build a campaign in California to improve state policies to reduce chronic absence. And over the years, as their work was successful, advocates in other states also tackled improving state policies. In those states, Attendance Counts, the project that Hetty now heads up, provided information and materials but was not a partner in the policy work itself. Today, Hetty Chang and Sue Fothergill will share the research and the resources available. Brad will tell you how the first state policy campaign has developed, including policies and strategies that you might want to use in your state. And Cindy Rice will describe the more recent New Jersey campaign where she has drawn on the information from Attendance Counts but has really led the state policy work. We hope that today's webinar will help you develop or improve campaigns to reduce chronic absence in your states. So I'm hoping that this poll worked, and I'm going to go to the results, and let's see what all of your experiences are. And it looks like we have almost more, half of our audience is knowledgeable in working on the issue. About 10% of you provide technical assistance, and we have 25% who are just starting to learn about it and 15% who are somewhat familiar with the issue. So we've got a pretty wide range of exposure to this. We have four speakers today. Um, one of them, of course, is Hetty Chang, who started Attendance Works. Um, Hetty is the executive director and of this national and state initiative that's aimed at increasing student success by reducing chronic absence. Um, Hetty has spent more than two decades working on family support, family economic success, education, and child development. She has worked at the Evelyn and Walter Haas Foundation and at California Tomorrow. She's joined by Sue Fothergill, also from Attendance Works, who facilitates the Attendance Work Network to advance um, state policy and practice. Um, and that's a network of more than 100 organizations in 31 states in D.C. 
Before joining Attendance Works, she served as the Director of Attendance and Related Strategies at the Family League of Baltimore and has held several other positions advocating for improved education in Baltimore and Maryland. Once we've heard from them, we're going to turn to state experience with partnership members. Brad Strong, who is the Senior Director of Education Policy at Children Now, will speak first. Um, before he went to Children Now, he worked in the California legislature for nine years, and he has 25 years of education and policy experience. And then we'll hear from Cindy who, Rice, who is an attorney and a senior policy analyst on the early childhood team at the, Assist the um, Advocates for Children of New Jersey. Um, she has worked at ACNJ for 14 years, and before that she spent three years as an assistant district attorney in the Bronx. Right. So I'm going to now turn this over to Sue and Hetty. And um, Sue, you should be also able to move the slides. Okay. Thank you, Deb. Um, Hetty and I would like to thank you, Deb, um, for inviting us to present on um, the Partnership for America's Children and thank all of you for joining us. Attendance Works deep, deeply values the relationships that we have with so many of you working on chronic absence. I'm going to talk for just a few minutes to ground us all in the foundational information of, of, of what we understand about chronic absence, how to define it and its academic impact, and then I'll turn it over to Hetty. And so one of the things I just want to be clear about is how we're defining chronic absence. And so it's different than average daily attendance and truancy. Chronic absence is a definition that helps us to know which students are missing so much school that they are academically at risk. And we're talking about any time that a student is missing out on instructional time, whether that child is missing out for excused reasons, maybe health-related reasons, or if a child is missing school for unexcused reasons, um, such as staying home and taking care of a sick sibling, or if a child is missing school due to suspensions. Um, currently, the definition uh, that is available, there's two definitions. One is the early warning indicator of 10% or more of a student's um, days on roll missed, um, missed instructional time. And that helps us to monitor attendance throughout the year and understand which children, at children in which populations of youth are missing so much school that they're academically at risk. Additionally, the Office of Civil Rights through its Civil Rights Data Collection Tool collects information on chronic absence, chronic absence and currently defines that as missing 15 or more days on roll, again, for any reason. It's different from truancy, which only explores unexcused absences, and it's different from average daily attendance, which monitors the average number of kids that show up on any given day. So if you look here on this slide for average daily attendance, just to show you the difference, um, each of these schools all have an average daily attendance rate of 90% or more. And oftentimes this can be confused with doing well in attendance if it's not also taken into consideration with chronic absence data. And what you can see here is that across these schools there's a wide range of chronic absence from less than 10% less than to nearly one out of four children being chronically absent. And so it's important that we help schools, districts, and states monitor and understand the different measures of data, looking at average daily chronic absence, and then also truancy. And what you can see here is um, the measure of truancy. And, and for Maryland, it is a particularly lagging indicator. Um, the measure is 36 days unexcused um, by the end of the year. And so when we were only monitoring truancy, um, several years ago, you can see we were missing thousands of children pre-K through 12th grade by not taking a closer look at which students were academically at risk. And so when I say that, what have we learned about chronic absence? Well, one thing we know is the relationship between early absenteeism and um, academic outcomes for, for students pre-K through third grade and their reading scores. Um, being impacted by the lost instructional time over years. And so the stair-step pattern you see here is a group of second graders from Chicago and their attendance over time and their second grade reading scores. And you'll notice for each additional year of chronic absence, the students' second grade reading scores were impacted um, substantially with a, with a significant amount of amount, um, a significant need by second grade for intervention for the students that had missed the most time. The other thing we know about chronic absence is its relationship to student outcomes later on. And as early as sixth grade, chronic absence is a leading indicator of whether or not students will graduate from high school. So with that background, I want to turn it over to Hetty to lead us into a discussion about the policy and practice opportunities related to chronic absence and preventing students from falling off track. 
thanks so much, Sue. Um, so um, one of the things that we were able to do and that has also um, really expanded attention to this is the fact that this year the Office for Civil Rights released data, the first nationwide data set on chronic absence, defined, as Sue mentioned, as missing 15 days or more. And we were able to partner with um, Everyone Graduates, um, and this is Bob Paul fans over at Johns Hopkins and his team, to really look at what can we learn about uh, the nature of the places which are facing the highest levels of chronic absence. Um, and uh, let me see if this works. Uh, yep, I can move the slides. So we actually combined um, date, that data with information around census tract and uh, data around poverty. And when we looked at it, here's what we found. We found that chronic absence is both widespread, found in 89% of the districts, but it is also highly concentrated. And so what this chart does is take that total number of about 6.5 million kids chronically absent throughout the country and divide it into quartiles. So, uh, you know, about 25% of the chronically absent kids, a quarter, are found in like 14,000 school districts. But half of the chronically absent kids, the third and the fourth quarters or quartiles, are found in only 654 or 4% 4 of the school districts and only 12% of schools in the, in the country. And you can see this map. It's um, kids, they're urban districts, they're suburban districts, they're rural districts, they're um, all over the place. But what we also saw was that there really were two kind of major types of districts that were in this 4%. One type of district is um, relatively affluent, fairly large districts that also, despite their affluence, still have a large number of students in poverty, Fairfax, Virginia, Montgomery County. Actually, I would count San Francisco into this mix. And then there was another type of district, which are um, the high poverty, racially segregated urban districts with high rates of chronic absence, which is like the Detroit, Cleveland, Milwaukee's, which really extraordinarily high level, but also extraordinarily um, racially and economically segregated. We also saw that rural communities are highly affected but they don't have large numbers of kids, so they're not found in that 50%, because these are districts with an overall population that's fairly, fairly small. But they have a high rate of chronic absence, so they may have 30, 40, sometimes 50 percent or more of their kids chronically absent, but they're found in these rural areas. So chronic absence is found in many places, but some places are harder hit. What did we then conclude from that? What are the implications for policy and action? Well, it means that cause you can find chronic absence everywhere. Most districts have some level. Everyone needs to take their data, not average daily attendance, not truancy data, and figure out, is this a challenge for some of our kids or many of our kids? In order for us to compare, though, that data across districts, across states, we've got to make sure it's consistent and accurate and we're comparing parents apples with apples, not apples and alligators. We need to use that data to understand where the need and disproportion impact. In a place like San Francisco, for example, it really calls attention to the educational inequity, the fact that we have a wealthy district and we are not effectively using our resources to ensure every kid in my own school district, as this happens to be where I live, um, is getting access to the kinds of education they deserve. But then in other places, like let's say in Michigan, where you have extraordinarily over 58% of their kids are chronically absent in Detroit, um, and that means there's probably implications at the state level because just within the resources of that high poverty, high need district, you know, they may not have sufficient resources within them to address the issue. We got to use the data though to also identify places getting results who can serve as bright spots of what works. We have to share this data with key stakeholders because part of the solution is not just schools alone. It's you taking a multi-sector approach so we can look at where's health, where's housing issues, where's transportation, so we can understand what the barriers are and take action. And we really need to take advantage of ESSA and use that so that we can create a sense of shared accountability and ongoing look at data to identify and, and change things. Um, 
This is about putting in place this peer support of intervention within every district and every school, um, but also thinking about how do we, at the district level and at the state level, make sure these peer supports work. And I, as we hear more about what happens in some of the communities, I think we'll have um, pictures of what this might look like. What we found, though, that's really connecting to the state policy is if we can make sure there are a couple of these bright spots, these communities which are doing great work, getting outcomes, that can both inspire and inform what needs to happen at the state level, and then that can actually help to expand the number of uh, communities and districts and agencies that are doing the good work so that more kids are getting to school so they can learn. Um, so, uh, well, before we go to that, one last thing I just say is we're talking about this kind of systemic approach where we're making sure that we have actionable data. We're building capacity to use that actionable data to determine how do we create positive engagement for kids so they want to be there. We use caring relationships so we can put in place these kinds of supports. Um, and then we also are creating shared accountability. So this isn't just about what districts do, but what districts combined with communities can do. And then I'd like to turn it back over to Sue to just take a moment to talk about the opportunity with the SSA. Thank you, Hetty. And so really quickly, we want to also share with you that we've been exploring the relationship between the ESSA decisions that have to be made across the country and what are the implications for chronic absence and the opportunity. And so one of the things we think are possible is we think the inclusion of, inclusion of chronic absence in the ESSA has the potential to offer the following opportunities. It helps to ensure attention to chronic absence as part of school improvement. It could help to permit understanding of underlying barriers in communities that have suffered from lack of investment, structural racism, and poverty. And it offers an annual process for looking at data to, de to determine which districts and schools need extra support in identifying the positive outliers that Hetty just talked about. At the same time, we know that this isn't without challenges. And so some of the things that we're already thinking about is what it would mean if, it, if states were to adopt uh, chronic absence as part of its school quality indicator that they'd also have to consider these challenges, such as ensuring consistent and accurate data, acknowledging and addressing the challenges facing schools and districts serving higher poverty communities so that the, that, the, that the inclusion of chronic absence and accountability doesn't become a tool for punishment or punitive action, but really as an opportunity to amplify the challenges that those districts are facing and to identify using chronic absence as a diagnostic tool to identify the barriers and we want to avoid creating blame um, and really focus on collective problem solving. The other, so this brief is available for you. We're also um, looking toward uh, developing the state peer intervention system to, to help frame out what states might do to offer support to states, whether the chronic absence indicator is in the school improvement um, school quality measure or whether it's part of the school improvement process, which is another place that it could be potentially located. The other thing we want to make sure that you are aware of is on our website, if you haven't visited, I encourage you to do so. We have information about state and, state and federal policy and practice. We also have um, access to key research about chronic absence, including its relationship to cross-cutting indicators, case studies of bright spots, schools, school districts, and states that are making a difference toolkits for uh, different groups of stakeholders, and we have data tools to help schools and districts um, analyze their data. And the other opportunity I'd like to share with you is we do have the Network to Advance Data Attendance Policy and Practice, and that's a group of, uh, of, of national and state SEA and state advocacy organizations that meet about four times a year, and it's really a dialogue around this issue of chronic absence and what are the ways we can advance reducing chronic absence through state policy and practice. And with that, I am going to turn it back to you, Deb. And let me just say one word, Sue. Sure. That the NACEP is, um, when Sue says meet, she means virtually meet through an hour and a half phone call. We believe in a low-cost meeting, so I just want people to be aware of that. So be, contact Sue if you're interested. Great. So before we turn to Brad, I just want to give everybody a moment to send us questions if you have them for Sue or Hetty. And you can do that again by using the chat feature. Um, when you select chat recipient, please make sure that you send it to the, all co-presenters or you can send it to everybody. Um, and that way we can talk first about the, the 
you know, the research and the indicator and the more technical pieces of this. And then if no one has any questions, we will move on to learning about the policy and advocacy part. Um, and Deb, can I clarify something? Sure. We do work on policy. We just don't lobby because we feel like we don't know the nuances. And that's actually the power, one of the part of the power of the relationship between Brad and I, which is Brad has really, he's so amazing in the way he can take policy and figure out where there's a legislative opportunity or lobbying, and he can move that, while what we do is try to create this, be a resource across states that um, really can talk about the concepts that need to be put into policy. And um, I just wanted to clarify that. So, you know, there, there's a wide range of doing policy that ranges from policy development to actually lobbying, and we do do the beginning part of that. And hopefully Great. that's how we can help all of everyone. Great. Thank you. So, Brad, if you want to take over here and talk about the California experience, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah. So, so my goal is really just to give a big picture of kind of what's happened in California and what our campaign in, in California has, has done in the last, I'd say, six, six seven years. So, um, and, I, and I think the, the participants are going to be at different phases. Some will probably be as advanced or, or more advanced, but to, to really be able to lift up some of the policy windows and kind of levers and opportunities that, that we took advantage of in California that you might, might be able to, to do elsewhere or, or, or um, just kind of, kind of lift up some of those, those things that we've, we've worked on. So, it kind of began, I'd say, in 2009. Um, California had a, a – the Public Policy Institute of California did a study of San Diego, um, the, uh, the uh, San Diego Unified School District, and, and they basically lifted up – and we were looking for early warning systems. What can you – you know, what, what, what are those – we know you need to be reading by grade three. We know you need to be, you know, able to pass the high school exit exam and graduate college and career, but what are those early early identifiers? and so they, they did, um, with San Diego data, attendance, behavior, and course performance, so a, the ABCs. And, and, and this was based on, on Dr. Bob Balfon's research and, and, and found that, that, that basically fourth and fifth grade indicators were as, were as predictive of ninth grade test scores in determining who was going to fail the high school exit exam. So it's like we need to start using those early warning systems and then same time, we actually uh, were fortunate enough to, to cross paths with Hetty, who was really honing in on a different way to look at the attendance component of that. And then going, she was going much deeper, much deeper in terms of saying, wait, wait a second, you know, we can even look at chronic absence. These are, these are show, chronic absenteeism. When you look at attendance in this way, is is identifying the same things and even earlier. And so, and she was driving back into even elementary and. And, and preschool and kinder, you know kindergarten to say these are these are predictive of, of who's not going to be reading by grade three, so it was kind of that f fortunate you know uh, uh, partnership that, that in 2009 and then 2010 we decided to, to kind of launch a statewide uh, campaign. So we um, had he uh, and I think even before the, you know the name attendance works, but it was definitely Hetty, um, and then Children Now and the Partnership for Children and Youth in California started a chronic absence and attendance partnership. And the first year we sponsored legislation that would define chronic absenteeism in state law. And that was really, you know, the main thing was to, to define chronic absenteeism and then try to begin collecting it into our statewide data system. Um, the, the CAP, which is the Chronic Absence and Attendance Partnership, there's a number of partners. It's Fight Crime Invest in Kids, the State PTA, California School Boards Association, the California School-Based Health Alliance, so a broad, broad uh, constituency, uh, you know, and stakeholders uh, all coming together to say, that, you know, that we need to really focus on on a cro chronic absenteeism. So we did, we were successful in getting that legislation passed in in the first year. I think that was in 2010, uh, and we we kind of were you know wrestling with, okay, what, you know, what do we do now? How do we how do we start moving this this conversation forward in a in a bigger way? We wanted to get it out further to more stakeholders. Went to the superintendent of public instruction uh, and, and urged him to uh, host a uh, basically a policy forum, um, and and we. We really put it on for the department and, and, and staffed and, and really did all the kind of the work to get it together and 
Um, so it was called t uh, Taking Attendance Seriously, Promoting School Success by Preventing Chronic Absenteeism. And, and so that was, we, we had uh, the superintendent, we brought Dr. Bal Balfans from, from John Hopkins and Hetty, um, really keynote, you know, the three of them were, were really the, the leads and, and to really, you know, get over 200 people in, in, and a lot of the Sacramento stakeholders to start really increasing the awareness um, back then. We joined the, the state SARB, which is the School Attendance Review Board, and Hetty and I uh, were fortunate. We, our, our Department of Education has, has been just champions. They, they, are, they really get this work. They understand the importance, um, they, and so we, we were placed, we were appointed by the superintendent to be on the State School Attendance Review Board, which is a number, basically counties throughout the state, a number of district folks um, all come together at the state SARB and, and make recommendations, statewide recommendations on, on how to improve attendance policy. Um, so we've really ha been a, a big part of that conversation. Um, and we're also, we're also often re, you know, speaking to the choir, but I think to some extent you know, it was a shift from kind of the what do you do when kids are missing school to um, how do we deal with prevention. Uh, and so it was a bit of a reorientation. The state SARB um, established a model SARB recognition program that really prioritized prevention and early identification and less punitive responses to poor attendance. Um, and that was you know, really kind of a, one of the things that we were pushing and, and, and has been really successful in, in helping districts to change their practices. Um, we also have an association, the California Association of Supervisors of Child Welfare and Attendance. So basically, the, you know, the folks that work on the school attendance review boards um, were, were involved in, uh, with the state SARB and, and in developing the model SARB programs. Um, in, uh, in 2011, we also did a governor's proclamation. So, you know, a good, a good opportunity to, to really kind of message and get the word out is a, is a proclamation. So we did a governor's proclamation. In 2013, we did a, a, a legislative resolution. So we passed in the legislature, we passed a resolution um, acknowledging School Attendance Awareness Month, that September would be Attendance Awareness Month, and then really did a lot of, of you know, all that the, the Attendance Works has been doing through the that now National Attendance Awareness Month, um, you know, we did some of the fledgling work in press conferences and media hits and to, you know, to, to start raising awareness. Um, in 2013, we also did a second policy forum. And this one, what we really started to do is, you know, try to spread out, you know, attendance is the problem, but what, but or, or, or kind of the, you know, the lens, it's like how do we pr improve, reduce chronic absenteeism and improve attendance, but, but then ask the bigger questions of what's the cause. And so we really started working with more of an interagency approach and tr to try to, um, we, we had a state policy uh, forum that brought together the uh, Attorney General, the Department of Health and Human Service, the Secretary of the Health and Human Services, and the Superintendent of Public Instruction. Um, and, and centered it around kind of a being well, learning well conversation. What, you know, why, why do kids miss school? They miss it because they're not safe routes to school. They miss it because the, you know, the asthma and oral health and, and you know, what are, there's a, you know, a lot of causes that are trauma, the, the mental health issues. So, uh, you know, to try to broaden the conversation into more of an interagency conversation. And so we hosted a second conference that really also brought in more stakeholders. So, and at that time, we were, we were also pivoting towards the, 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 um, the Office of Civil Rights had been really identifying the, the uh, suspensions, expulsions, uh, the, the, uh, particularly for defiance and disruption, you know, lo, low, uh, low, low level offenses and really pushing kids out of school. And so we really drove, drove into those conversations as well. And we passed legislation. Um, to, to eliminate uh, suspensions for grades TK through three and all expulsions for defiance and disruption. Um, we were working on uh, an entirely new finance, school finance formula in California. Uh, we, the goal was to really provide more local control and flexibility, move away from categorical programs. But, the, but we also saw the critical policy lever here was 
okay, if we're going to give all this money to the locals, how do we still establish state priorities? And what are the state priorities that the state needs to say districts need to be monitoring and tracking within the communities to ensure that, uh, you know, we're not going to give a pot of money for safe route to schools, but how do you know that, you know, that the kids are getting the services they need? So that's when we elevated chronic absenteeism, um, basically school climate and student engagement, and uh, suspensions and expulsions. So that, you know, we said, this sounds great. Let's give more money to English learners, low income, and foster youth. So you're targeting more dollars to, the, to, to students most in need, removing kind of the categorical strings, but then but then we were pretty emphatic you had to have an accountability structure or a priority prioritization to ensure that they were really tracking monitoring um, the suspensions expulsions and chronic absence and school climate um, that's been a kind of a three-year process come kind of coming to a head this year um, fits well within ESSA uh, the every student succeeds act in terms of uh, at least one other indicator um, back in June, we succeeded in, in, in uh, the State Board of Education has adopted chronic absenteeism. Um, we, we, uh, California had a, had a little bit more of a slog in terms of we can't just mandate um, that, di that districts all collect chronic absenteeism. Um, and the reason we have to pay for every state mandate, and I don't know, it's, I know there's less than half the states are, are in, that, of, in that boat, but Basically, if the state says you need to collect a chronic absenteeism and report it to the state, then you can get hit with a you know five, ten, fifteen, twenty million dollar state mandate for all the costs of data collection and reporting, um, and and so it really creates a high hurdle for for us to do these things. But when we were able to use the lever and link it to uh, really the the reform of the finance formula. Um, and then now with ESSA in the, making, you know, making it clear that that was a, a kind of a requirement um, uh, to have a multiple measure system, it gets us past, past that. Um, so we will be putting chronic absenteeism into our statewide accountability system as uh, they at least one additional non-academic measure to meet the, the federal requirements. We are also focusing on, on suspension in school climate, surveys of parents, students, and teachers. Uh, in terms of uh, safety and connectedness and, and engagement um, are all things that, that we've really been building into our statewide accountability system. So how, how am I doing on time here? Um, I think you're pretty much right on time. If you have a few more things you want to say, go right ahead. Um, yeah, so, so, uh, so we've done a, several resolutions in the legislature. Um, the shift on, on uh, more recently on the suspensions and expulsions, uh, what, one of the things that California uh, had a, a program or, or a proposition that passed that it was to, redu it was to release nonviolent offenders, and 25% of those dollars were to go to education in terms of the savings. So if we release nonviolent offenders, um, then the savings from that proposition 75% was to prevent the pipeline to prison, 25% was for education to prevent the pipeline to prison. So we completely you know, engaged with the drafting of how those dollars are going to go out to, to school districts and what they would be used for. And they fit you know, basically for student districts that have high rates of chronic absenteeism, high suspension rates. Um, those districts are going to be eligible for the, uh, for, for the additional grants from this, this program, which will be, um, we have $28 million this year to go out in those grants. Uh, and, and they're really to, for non-punitive practices that, uh, that in, improve student attendance, uh, reduce truancy and chronic absenteeism. Uh, and you, you can also think of you know, the types of programs are restorative justice, the positive behavior supports and interventions, tiered interventions, the, the, the multi-tiered systems of support, um, and, and really, if you look at Hetty's you know, slide, any of those, any of those are gonna, you know, really going to be the types of programs that, that districts can be implementing to um, early identification and, 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 and um, support to, to uh, reduce chronic absenteeism. So I have a lot more, but I think I'm going to stop because I think I'm going to be running over. 
<laughs> Thanks, Brad. Cindy? Cindy, you may be Hi. trying to unmute her from there. You go. Hi, I just did. Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, uh, thanks, Deb, and um, for allowing me to talk a little bit about New Jersey's story in battling chronic absenteeism. And hello to our friends um, at Attendance Works. So, ACNJ Advocates for Children of New Jersey is our state's largest multi-issue advocacy organization. But we became involved in tackling chronic absenteeism in a very different way. The New Jersey Department of of Education actually contacted us. So it it started as one of our state's assistant commissioners had been at a conference and decided to go to a breakout session about chronic absenteeism, and Hetty was doing the presenting. I really believe that uh, chronic absenteeism became an important issue in our state on that day. This assistant commissioner, Barry Ehrlichson, went back to Trenton, began to look um, at our state data, and knew immediately something had to be done. She just didn't think that the DOE was the right entity to take on the issue, and that's when she called us. So to be honest, it was never on our radar. We do a lot of advocacy and education, primarily early education. And so when she began to talk to us about it, we initially thought that we'd just look at the early years, but when we looked more closely, we really knew that we had to take on the entire uh, pre-K-12 continuum. And the reason was that we recognized as advocates, no matter how successful, um, you know, any education reform was, if kids weren't in school, they would never uh, realize success. So we worked very collaboratively with the Department of Education. We got the data from them, who incidentally got the data from the districts. This becomes important to the New Jersey uh, story because the districts did, were not required to actually do their chronic absenteeism calculation. We got the data and we got to work. So we looked at the data in several ways. First, the overall state data. We looked by grade, by demographics, and by district. And what we saw was that New Jersey's data reflected the national data. It was high at the beginning and high at the end of students' educational experience. Um, Children from low-income families, children of color, and children with special needs were disproportionately represented in our data. But then we started to think, so what are we going to do with all this data? Um, And we decided that we chose our result, and that was that we were going to reduce, we were going to do everything we can to advocate for the reduction of chronic absenteeism. But we realized right from the beginning that we needed to be very intentional in our approach because, frankly, this really was a touchy subject. Um, When the data would come out, we knew that people were going to become defensive, and we wanted the parties involved not to be that way. We also recognized that the data really was just the first chapter of of the total story. We had to ask why were kids missing so much school, and we imagined that those stories were different depending on the district or the community, um, and how were schools going to find out the reasons and what resources were available to help them solve those problems once they determined what those reasons were. And we knew by this time um, we had already been introduced to Attendance Works, and we knew that their data would help support our campaign. So we're a bunch of policy wonks. Uh, We knew that we would have to do some kind of policy brief. But uh, we were going to report on the state data, but we needed to do more than just that, um, to report the state numbers. It really didn't get to the heart of the problem. And so um, while there's lots of great examples in attendance works, we supplemented with individual New Jersey stories. We're a proud state. We keep it in the family, and we wanted to make sure that we were describing best practices that were already going on in our, in our state. So we chose two, air, uh, two districts, one in urban, one in a more rural area, to demonstrate that change actually could take place. Um, and we also reported about attendance works as a resource. But looking at the data through the state lens wasn't enough. We knew that it would not drive change alone. So on, because really, on many levels, chronic absenteeism is a local issue. So how could we bring it down to the local level? So we decided, to we had all the data, we would identify the districts that were struggling. And that really was a tough, a tough thing to do. It was very touchy. Our goal was not for school administrators to become defensive, which we were really worried about, but rather to begin to have them recognize that there was a problem in their schools. We had identified about 177 school districts, or 77,000 of the total uh, of 125,000 kids who were identified in the 2013-14 school year as being chronically absent. And what we did, we, those 177 superintendents received a letter 
an embargoed copy of the report and a county fact sheet four weeks before the release of the state report. We told them in the letter that the report would be released in the second week of September and that our goal was not to embarrass them or, or their schools, but rather to bring attention to the issue. We also said that along with the statewide report, these county fact sheets would be online and they identified all the districts in each county in our state that had 10% or more of their students identified as chronically absent. We told them also that um, that we wanted them to be, be prepared because we assumed that the media would be in touch with them and that this was a solvable problem and that there were plenty of resources including attendance works which we included all the information about attendance work um, to help them work out and to reduce their chronic absenteeism. Two days after those, that packet went back, my phone started ringing. And I have to tell you, no one called me to thank me. No one. And frankly, many of them were not very nice on the phone. They wanted to know where, and in complete Jersey style, there was a few expletives along the way, where we got those numbers because th this was the main thing. Their average daily attendance numbers were terrific. It really gave us pause because we knew immediately they did not understand the difference between average daily attendance and chronic absenteeism. Um, but we figured that this would happen, so we had a plan with the Department of Education. Um, they, we assumed that when we told them that this was their data that they gave to the DOE, they wouldn't believe us. So we had, uh, we had it all set up for them to contact the DOE, the person, the data person at the DOE who was actually working with these numbers, and they all called them, and I did not get one call back once they began to understand that, no, they were not looking at chronic absenteeism, but ra rather average daily attendance. Um, we had developed a whole media campaign, so a week before the release, we began to put out teasers on the data because we thought this, we wanted to bring great attention, which in a state that had never given this any attention. We had a virtual press conference, um, and um, we talked about the data, and but also had those administrators talk about how they were working to reduce um, chronic absenteeism, and then we gave all the information again about attendance works and how this was a source um, that could not be beat and all on all approaches to reducing chronic absenteeism. And we had incredible, incredible press coverage. Every media outlet in the state had at least one story on the report and several had follow-up stories and op-eds um, about the specific communities in which they worked. Within a week of the release of the report, the Senate Minority Office called, and a one senator, Diane Allen, was, in, was interested in, in um, introducing legislation. We began to talk to her about what were the things that we were finding and what would be a more systemic approach to addressing chronic absenteeism. So one of the things we saw was the definition. We needed to define it within our state. We also saw in our school report cards that not every school actually reported their chronic absenteeism, and we really thought that this, the community should know what their numbers are. We particularly saw this in high schools. And last, we said we have to think differently about how schools that were really struggling addressed it. So the bill included um, any school that had 10% or more of their students identified as chronically absent had to, um, had to develop a committee that uh, included which included one parent that looked at chronic absenteeism. Um, so, so uh, and that, that push, I have to tell you, we got some pushback from many of the education associations who really didn't want a parent as part of this team. Um, unfortunately, it w the bill was introduced very towards the end of the legislative session where the legislators uh, were more interested in, um, in uh, our roads and our bridges, that's no pun intended for New people who follow New Jersey um, politics, but, um, and so it, it never got to the full floor. The bill was reintroduced again in the new session, um, and, and we're working on, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but because most of our focus is on early education and we're housed in Newark, we wanted to report on what was going on in the early years. Um, and by the way, the report that just came out, that the report that I just described, it was, it was a year ago, September, so it's 13 months. We wanted to th then focus on, on our home in Newark um, and what's going on in the early years. We had the data and it was, it was just terrible. And so we wanted to put a face on the numbers. And so what we decided to do to, was to do a, a report 
talk about the data, but also talk about the issues in this particular community. So we inter interviewed school administrators, and we had focus groups with teachers and nurses and parents. I have been a child advocate for 24 years, and I've heard lots of stories. I never heard some of the stories that were so moving on how hard it is sometimes to get children, particularly in a poor community like this, to school. So um, what we saw was crystal clear was that chronic absenteeism really was the gateway to other issues such as health, transportation, weather, and conflicting work and school schedules. And all of the issues identified in this particular case were linked with poverty. This report was released in January, and it also had the data, but it told the stories of the families of the school, of the teachers that we talked to in the focus groups. Um, and I have to tell you, the district was really, really worried and pushed back quite a bit. We again told them, um, you know, went back to our original result about improving chronic absenteeism. It was not our intent to embarrass, embarrass the district, with, which frankly happens all the time, um, but to improve the students' attendance in the community in which we work. Um, and so we decided to hold a forum, which included a release of the data and the responses of the individuals and groups who helped us explain the data. It was, I tell you, standing room only. But the forum included a panel, which included an assistant superintendent from the district, the mayor's education liaison, um, the city health commissioner, the former head of a clinic, health clinic, who had been addressing chronic absenteeism but ran out of funds, and a representative from another urban district that had sig significantly reduced chronic absenteeism in her school. I think it was the most important part of the day because until that morning, none of these major city officials had ever talked about chronic absenteeism and the impact it was having on the kids in this town. Um, and so on that day, um, the representatives from both the school district and the mayor's office committed to work collaboratively to address the issues that were causing um, so many Newark students in the school. And I'm happy to report that that has happened. This was just last January. At a meeting, I was at a meeting last week um, with preschool administrators throughout the, st the state. And the Newark team has done so much in these last 10 months. They were asked to present on their accomplishments. Um, one of the administrators said that when our report was released, everything and everyone in the district stopped. At, and it was at that time the district really pivoted towards seriously addressing their chronic absenteeism problem. In those months since the release, the superintendent has convened an attendance committee in which our executive director is the co-chair. They have they've focused on external and community linkages, including health, transportation, and school culture and climate. And they've had internal work going on. They revised all of their existing policies around attendance data, collection, and analysis, and school accountability. Um, for attendance. And as a result, there was a manual developed and professional development took place this summer for building leaders on how to address chronic absenteeism. And each principal is now required to develop improvement plans on how they're going to address chronic absenteeism in their school. The mayor's office has taken two stakeholder groups focused on children's issues. Um, and they're both now focusing on chronic absenteeism. One of the committees in particular is looking at health issues and its impact on chronic absenteeism, which is a huge part of our conversation, uh, particularly around asthma. And in one of Newark's poorest wards, there are a group of community schools, and they've included chronic absenteeism as a performance metric. And this is all since this January in our largest school district. And ACNJ has been helping along the way. Um, there uh, the focus groups, for example, in the focus groups, parents told us that for young students that they miss so much because neither preschool or kindergarten is required in our um, in our state, and so we began to de develop demographic um, infographics that I'm trying to change. The, I'll move it for you. Okay, thank you. Infographics that looked at um, 25 um, that looked at explaining to parents clearly the message was not getting down to parents to say every day matters, even when you're three years old or four years old. And so then we started looking at our data on preschool in every district, and we said this is not a problem unique to Newark. So we developed a, a template um, that we sent out to all of the preschool programs to say please share these with your communities, with, uh, with your parents, so that they better understand um, and we did this in English, Spanish, and Portuguese, the three um, most 
common languages in our state. Um, uh, last month, we received a, uh, we released a second statewide report and got as much coverage as the last time. The superintendent letters went out again a month before the release, and we got a lot fewer calls this time around. Thankfully, um, we we had uh, we actually had we put together frequently asked questions. Much of the information from attendance works to look at to help people understand the differences and. Um, and we brought the data back down to the local level. Um, and we also thought, because the bill was reintroduced, that every legislator needed to understand, you know, all politics is local. So we knew we would get in buy-in if they understood their own data. So every legislator got a copy of the report and their own, a list of the districts in their specific legislative district with high concentrations of chronic absenteeism. Um, there were, uh, we recently, my, our executive director and I recently went to a meeting with the new chair of the Assembly Education Committee. We had a whole bunch of education issues to talk about, but we started with chronic absenteeism. We had her data. The whole meeting, she couldn't get past her numbers. They were so high, and she kept saying, no matter what topic we were talking about, as soon as you leave, I'm calling the superintendent. I cannot believe how high these numbers are. Um, so, uh, so that's, I, I know that we, we uh, I know that Brad mentioned ESSA. I just want to mention that in New Jersey, we are looking at this as a tremendous opportunity to bring chronic absenteeism um, as part of ESSA. We're hoping that it will be included in our state plan as one of um, as one or part of the student success or school climate indicators. So I'm going to stop right there because I'm looking at the time to see if there's any questions because it's a lot to cover in, in just a few minutes. Cindy, yes, this is there are some Patty. great questions. And um, I'm just going to say first, Cindy, if you'll send me the bill, I'll send it to everyone because we have a request sure. for it. Sure. Um, and I'm going to take. Dad, can um, I offer one little tiny quick? Statement, sure. Go which ahead. Is just one of the big differences between California and New Jersey is that California doesn't have attendance data in a longitudinal student data system, but the vast majority of places are more like New Jersey. You have it, but no one, people often haven't looked at it. I just wanted people to understand that. There's only a handful of states, uh, California, Colorado, New York just started adding it, but, and, and there's, this is changing rapidly. I just wanted people to have that context. So okay. we couldn't and have looked at the data. Thanks. And so, that we will have that in California at the, end, at the end of this year, end of year collection is the first time we'll have it. Um, and it, and that's, that's what will enable us to put it into the accountability system. Great. So we have at least two really excellent questions, and I'm actually going to take the second one first because I suspect one of you can answer it, and then the second one may have multiple answers. Um, so the first question is, what benefits would a state like Texas, which has ADA funding, which I take it means average daily attendance funding, have in adopting a statewide definition of chronic absenteeism? And I thought maybe Sue or Hetty, you could take this. I can cover that too, so let's oh, go okay. first. Um, so I'll start, and then, um, and then. So one of the benefits, I think that was the question. The benefit. So while the um, communities communities are funded by average daily attendance, it's oftentimes oftentimes difficult to move um, average numbers. And so in the same way, if you had an average reading score of a group of third graders and wanted to figure out which uh, third graders were at risk, it doesn't give you that information. And so chronic absence by helping districts and schools identify and use their chronic absence data when they move significant numbers of kids back um, to showing up more regularly, then that can affect their, uh, um, affect their average daily attendance rate over time. It's much more difficult and challenging for schools and school districts to figure out how to move averages. And then Hedy um, and Brad, I would also just say that chronic absence is about changing outcomes for kids academically. Average daily yeah. attendance is about funding. If you use chronic absence to target your work, you can figure out who needs support so their academic outcomes will improve. And it will actually allow you to increase at the local level the amount of dollars that uh, localities receive. Um, and sometimes states like that and sometimes they don't. And Brad, you had something you wanted to add? I was going to say, for states that um, California is a state that has ADA funding but does not count excused absences into average daily attendance. So there's states that may be enrollment-based. If you're an enrollment-based funding state, 
I would, you know, and we've fought off. That's been a defense move with the, the you know, with our attendance partnership, is to to send off any efforts to move towards enrollment. Um, and states that have ADA funding but still fund count excused absences as ADA. Um, if you're in either of those scenarios, th then that would be a policy to pursue to make sure that attendance matters, and it matters at the dollar, at the you know, at the bottom line, at the per pupil cost. Another thing that states can be doing or the groups can be doing is actually saying how much it is per student. So California, it's like $55 a day. So for every, every day missed, and so then it, when, it, when it starts to really translate to actual dollars and they see it, it's $55, 55 you know, a day for every, every, every day missed, that those prevention activities are well worth funding. If once you define it, then you have the ability to, like I said, in California, we, you know, we just put it, we're going to put out $28 million um, to districts that you could target to high needs districts and schools based on high rates of chronic absenteeism. It can, you can use it for the accountability um, and, uh, you know, local improvement plans. So when, dis when as part of ESSA, you identify the, the, the districts, um, or actually schools under ESSA, and when you identify the schools that are, are in targeted improvement or, or in, uh, comprehensive support, um, those part of the technical assistance and support activities can be driven towards, you know, towards, towards improving their chronic absenteeism once you've defined it. Great. And then we have a question that I'm really eager to hear all of your answers on. And this is from Erica Johnson. How do you balance attendance policy with a culturally responsive lens that takes into account families' need to travel, often for longer periods of time, such as a family that needs to return to China for six weeks? And I'm guessing there are other examples of um, cultural needs that require kids to uh, be out of school for a period. I don't know which of you wants to tackle that first. Um, I can tackle it. Uh so we see that issue all the time, and I think there's a couple of things. One is that when you look at chronic absence data, one of the key things you need to do is bring people who are part of that community in to interpret it and understand it, um, but, and that is to figure out how you're going to have a, a responsive tailor. So we see a lot of immigrant families who are trying to both keep their home language and home culture, go back for a long period of time, but the problem is they actually don't necessarily understand what their kids are missing um, while they're gone. So they're not weighing. They came here for maybe, a, you know, because they want their kids to get a good education. They may not understand the consequences of leaving. The other possibility, this is something that they do in California, is you can create a kind of independent study program where you really clearly define if you're going to be gone, what's the kind of um, uh material you're going to cover. Now, it's tricky because not all times parents can cover that material while our kids are out, but you're trying to help families understand what are the academic consequences. And you also need people from those communities to, do, to help educate families because it's really about families balancing multiple issues and challenges that they need to face so that they can make good academic choices or good choices about what's the most important thing for their families and their kids. And I will say that we see this, um, you need to educate families before they start making their holiday plans. And on um, one of the materials that the Tenants Board has on its website is uh, give the gift of attendance for the holidays so that you can really help parents understand the importance of not taking extra time, particularly if their kid's struggling in school and they don't have other ways for their kids to make up for the time on task. You know, can I just add something? I, I, was, I did a presentation yesterday and got asked this question about you can't possibly um, compare uh, someone, uh, you know, a family who takes their child out for an educational um, experience and, um, and will help them with their work to being chronically absent. And I, I, I mean, I think part of that is about how do, you, how do you explain that every day does matter, that it's not just about whether you did the math work, but what's going on, the social and emotional development, like particularly with young children? How is, that, how is that message being sent that every day does matter? I know that, um, and I know this is a group that Attendance Works um, worked with. Uh, there was a pr principal in Patterson, New Jersey, 
who when there, when there was children that were chronically absent, she would figure out by the hour how many hours the child missed of school and talk to the parents about it in that context, quantifying the numbers on how other kids benefited from those missed hours and your child didn't, was a way that she found was very, very productive. But, but that's not a systems approach. It has, it has to be, you know, what are the messages coming down to parents? And it's, you know, it's tough um, that, you know, telling families you should go in the, can you go in the summer um, when flights are more expensive or whatever, but because your child is missing. It's a, it's a tough call, but sending that message early and often is key. Great. Um, Sue or Brad, did you want to add to that? I mean, on culturally responsive, this doesn't answer the policy question, but I'll tell you one thing that California has been doing. We've been completely overhauling the standards for administrators and teachers. So in terms of the schools of uh, programs of professional preparation um, and to, to completely revamp them, probably not as much chronic absence, but it, it really, the, the school discipline and the, uh, the um, to really address the, the kind of the non-punitive practices. So we've uh, all the new standards and expectations for teachers and administrators include mental health, trauma, um, culturally responsive, uh, implicit, explicit bias, um, restorative practices, uh, positive, uh, positive discipline. So all of that, have, they've been completely overhauled, and programs are, are now aligning with those to, to really build into that, you know, kind of re culturally responsive into, the, into our uh, preparation programs. And then I would just finish with um, offering that some of the best examples that I've seen at schools that have uh, populations, large populations of, of children of uh, first or second gener gen generation um, immigrant families is this real um, intentional goal to build a community with those families and with those com sort of the, the cultural norms of those communities within the school community. So if celebrations are something that that, that particular community um, really is invested in or if there are specific times of year that are valuable to those communities that the school community really identifying and understanding what those are and helping to create that space so that they're sharing them together. Wonderful. We don't seem to have any more questions here, um, but I would invite anyone that has some after the webinar to send them to me at dstein at the number four, americaschildren.org, and I'll try and get you answers. Um, after the webinar, I will circulate the PowerPoint and Cindy's bill, mm -hmm. and if anyone else has something they think the other uh, people listening in on the webinar would like to see as well, I'd be more than happy to share that as well. So I'll wait a couple of days before I send these out. Um, it will take me a little longer to get the recording down and posted, but I will also share the recording when it's available. Um, I would really like to thank all of our speakers today, Hetty and Sue and Brad and Cindy, and uh, I know I found this really helpful. I hope everyone else did. And uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great day, everyone.